Hello everyone, thank you for listening to my talk. In this presentation, I begin with the conference's question about the parallels and mutual influences of the city and countryside, quickly turn the question on its head and reflect upon what it means to live in a place in which waterways are more consequential than settlements on the land. I'll do this through an extended example from my research about 19th century British Honduras, now Belize. The opening example in the conference's call for papers is the 2020 Guggenheim exhibition by Rem Koolhaas and Samir Bantal called Countryside the Future. The exhibition considers the quote radical experimentations in living and creating in rural spaces in the 21st century. The fact that the countryside would represent the future is surprising, they tell us in an introductory video. Kulhas points to an agricultural field saying, quote, it is very exciting to consider that the future of the world is starting there. Bantar says that the countryside is the, quote, forefront of modernization, something we thought the city was. The designers are obviously subverting the modernist notion that cities are the loci of progress and modernization. But are they really? Both modernism and the new Guggenheim exhibition draw from a specific time-space matrix in which populated settlements on the land are distinguished from one another in terms of size and population density, and places on the land have temporal characters. The Kulhas Bantal exhibit differs by crediting rural sites as bearing the potential for progress and modernization. The whole notion of modernization itself is problematic, of course, but two additional problems linger. The dichotomization of city and countryside, and the assumption that progress is situated on the land. The city-countryside dichotomy focuses attention on two spatially distinctive places on the land. But we know these do not exist as isolable locations. They are connected and interdependent in many ways. In many instances, it may be the connective tissue between spaces that is the source of energy, movement, and innovation. In this work, I've been inspired by Tim Ingold, who considers how humans, other living beings, and elements of the natural world are enmeshed. We do not exist in isolation, but we affect one another mutually, as we are all in the process of becoming. We are all moving and growing simultaneously with and against one another. We are used to thinking of humans as the drivers of progress in history, but various elements of the world around also have power, assets, energy, and they create risks and rewards. Now let's dive into our example, the life of the river. In 19th century Belize, rivers and streams were the means with which people oriented themselves in space, the primary channel of long distance transportation, a focal point for nearly all productive and commercial activity, the locus and focus of political disputes, and symbols and indices of both danger and freedom. In the 19th century, what is now Belize was the fledgling colony of British Honduras. It was a region reigned by water, bordering on the Caribbean Sea with low average elevation and a hot tropical climate, a tangle of rivers, streams, lagoons, and mangrove swamps carves out pockets of cahoon ridges and thick hardwood forests. The extensive system of waterways is sustained by heavy rainfall throughout the year, heaviest in the rainy season of summer and fall. Those conditions hinder overland navigation. And the early Spanish colonizers discovered that paths for horses and mules would be quickly overgrown by vegetation and washed out by rains, and wagons would sink in the mud, especially during the rainy season. One road to Bacalard, for example, became known as horse bones for its notoriously perilous mud traps. Consequently, all the way through the early 20th century, nearly all long distance transportation was conducted by water, specifically pit pen canoe, which can navigate even the shallowest of streams. Rivers represented wealth. European colonizers, first Spaniards and then the British, followed the waterways in their search for riches, which they would then transport back along those waterways to ports and out to overseas markets. The first commodity exploited was logwood, which, when split, 
yields rich red and purple dyes. As red and purple were the colors of royalty and nobility, logwood trees were a coveted prize. Logwood grows in thick stands right along the water. The base of the tree is the portion from which the dye is extracted, and the trunks would be cut into small logs bundled on a person's back and transported via the small canoes. Notice that I haven't said anything thus far about countryside and towns, because in the 18th century they were almost an afterthought. The woodcutters, including the British and enslaved people of African, indigenous, and mixed descent, did not live in permanent settlements, but made temporary camps, building small huts or sleeping in hammocks extended between trees. They did not seek to own land because what they wanted was to be able to move wherever the trees were found. The British woodcutters laid temporary claims to stretches of lands called works. They would erect a hut along the water's edge and extend out from it in both directions. The rivers represented progress, not settled towns. When semi-permanent settlements were established, they were associated with women, children, and food cultivation, not progress. Incessant warring with Spain was occasionally broken up by treaties and times of peace. In a series of treaties in 1763, 83, and 86, Spain allocated a portion of its lands in Central America to Great Britain for timber harvesting. The limits of the timber harvesting region were defined by rivers, streams, and lagoons. That made sense because, in the absence of regular surveyors, waterways were the most visible markers of location. In addition, the waterways were not only useful points of orientation, but they were in fact how people were oriented. Nearly all productive activity, commercial and otherwise, was done in relation to the waterways. The 1763 treaty permitted extraction of logwood But even at that time, what British woodcutters most desired was mahogany, a dense, rot-resistant hardwood with a glorious sheen that was the preferred wood for luxury furniture in Europe and North America. Because mahogany grows very differently than logwood, the mahogany boom changed how woodcutters related to the land, but they remained steadfastly oriented to the riverways. Mahogany prefers drier soils and so it grows inland rather than along rivers and streams. The trees are enormous, each tree producing up to four tons of wood. To get a sense of perspective, can you see the tiny man in a white shirt at the base of the tree? Mahogany trees, however, grow at a very low density, one tree per 2.5 square acres. They are also very slow growing, and once cut, it would take more than 30 years for a new tree to reach a harvestable size. Since they are so dispersed and slow growing, woodcutters would have to move further and further upstream to find new trees. This drove the woodcutters to move deeper into the forests where the indigenous people had built settlements that were intentionally hidden away from European invaders. Once a tree was cut, a road had to be cleared to transport the enormous logs to the banks along the edge of the river, where they would be lashed into rafts and floated downstream to the ports and out to sea. Still, rivers were the lifeblood of the British colony, essential for progress and wealth, not so the settled towns and villages. Very little commercial activity took place outside of what was transported by water. Rivers were political. Rivers were a primary, even the primary, political concern for British officials in the 19th century. Since the treaties with Spain established waterways as the borders of the British timber harvesting region, of critical importance was which one of a river's multiple tributaries would represent the source of the river and therefore the true boundary between British Honduras and Mexico. After Mexico gained independence from Spain, Britain saw the opportunity to possibly claim sovereignty over British Honduras and transform what had just been a timber extraction region into a fixed colony. The British sought, therefore, to establish Blue Creek, 
the northernmost tributary, as the true source of the Ando River. In 1837, Superintendent MacDonald set out on a three-day exploratory canoe trip up the Ando River to observe the volume of water that flowed through its tributaries, and conveniently he declared the Blue Creek, rather than the Booths River, to be the true source. If the treaties with Spain no longer pertained, border negotiations with Mexico presumably would start with the limits as defined by the Anglo-Spanish treaties, and if the Blue Creek were the true source, that would put Britain in the most favorable negotiating position. Rivers were dangerous. Rivers were a powerful current in British relations with the indigenous Maya. In 1847, peasants in eastern Yucatan, primarily of Maya descent, initiated a social war uprising against Yucatecan elites, more commonly known as the caste war, which stretched out a half century until 1901. Throughout the war, British Honduran traders were the primary source of guns, gunpowder, and lead for the Maya rebels, and these munitions were transported along the waterways. By 1853, one very large group of Western Maya brokered a peace treaty with the Yucatecan government and thereafter became known as the Pacificos. The treaty committed the Pacificos to join in the fight against the Eastern rebels. And these two Maya groups were then set against one another. The munitions that the British Honduran traders ferried upriver, therefore, were also used in rebel attacks against the Pacificos, who came to deeply resent the British Honduran traders, as well as British officials who, through inaction and ineptitude, allowed the munitions sales to continue. Both Maya groups began to charge the British Honduran timber crews for rent on lands they used, in part because those funds would support their defense. Since the headquarters for the British logging crews were still along the riverbanks, when rent payments were not made, retaliatory Maya attacks took place at those riverbank locations. West India regimental soldiers were then sent in boats upriver to retaliate against the Maya and protect the loggers. Rivers promised refuge. Rivers also represented refuge for two overlapping groups of people, indebted servants and deserters. Throughout the 19th century, on both sides of the Ando River in Yucatan and British Honduras, employers used the tactics of monopolization of land wage advances, and the company store to ensnare workers in debt servitude. If peasants didn't have access to land, they would agree to work for an employer in woodcutting or agriculture for a period of time and accept an advance on their wages paid in cash and kind, with the value of the goods provided set at marked up prices. Wages earned would be spent at the employer's store again at marked up prices to such an extent that the worker remained trapped in debt servitude. Flight was the only way out of this trap, but there were few truly safe spaces because of the monopolization of land. The best option was to flee across the river with the hope that those on the opposite side, who were the antagonists of your employer, would not permit your employer to cross to capture you. Similarly, those who had been pressed into military service, whether into the Yucatecan army or one of the two Maya military groups, could most successfully desert and avoid recapture if they crossed to the other side. Consequently, by the 1860s, a distinctive pattern was established along the Onda River. Peasants would farm on the northern side of the river on lands claimed by one Maya military group or the other, and they were treated more or less like feudal vassals. They would have to pay rent and also participate in military campaigns when called upon. They hoped to avoid debt servitude in British Honduras by farming to the north of the river, and then to escape rent and forced military service if they lived to the south of it. However, 
Maya military leaders would cross the river, quote, invading the British colony to collect rent and recapture deserters and absconded debtors. These combined riverine aggravations ultimately transformed the British colony. New administrative districts were created, a frontier police force was created, and military fortifications built, all oriented to the river. In many ways, therefore, in 19th century British Honduras, neither city nor countryside represented the energy of the region. What powered everything kept everything electrified and charged in the form of wealth, political negotiations, flight, and armed conflict with the currents and torrents of the rivers. What does this mean for architecture, design, and built forms? It might mean listening to the stories of the local rivers, coastlines, forests, engaging with them and honoring them in some way. If built forms are to recognize indigenous histories, since human histories emerge simultaneously with the histories of features of the landscape and the natural world, then those built forms should capture that history, which is at once human and environmental.